We're moving on now to the stifle, and uh, we have three speakers uh, to, to talk about the stifle. Uh, two, yeah, two are present here in Zurich, and two are online contributors. Um, our first speaker is Stefan Schaufogel. And Stefan is going to talk about uh, a, a very interesting project about doing the very first TPLO in Rwanda. So uh, welcome, Stefan. Thank you, Dan. He hello, everyone here in the room and online, somewhere, anywhere in the world. Um, well, the next talk is actually, it's something different. So it's, it's, it's don't expect a, a medical talk because when we go to Africa, everything is different. And what I learned from, from Tati, from the, from the talk before, before we had lunch, you know, you have to think about everything. And when you think about everything, it's still not really Africa. So it's beyond everything. And, but it's an interesting thing. And veterinary medicine in Africa is, in the, in the project I will talk about, is, is um, actually the purpose of something else. And thank you very much for, for Kion, for Kion, to having me here and give me the opportunity to talk about the project. Actually, normally you say I have nothing to declare. Here it's actually the opposite, because I'm, I'm talking about um, Future for Kids. It's a non-profit organization, a non-government organization from Austria. And here in the middle you see Otto Fischer, the mastermind of Future for Kids, He's a an, an veterinarian from Austria. He's a small animal um, dermatologist. And the second guy who is very important is here on the left, Thomas Schwarzmann. He's another veterinarian from Austria. He's a surgeon. And he's the one who asked me, actually, he, he didn't, he, it was not asking. He said to me, you have to come with me and we have to train all the vets, or not all the vets, but some of the vets in Africa. So that was the beginning. So it's more... It's not a disclosure, it's actually the opposite. Well, when we talk about Rwanda, Rwanda is an interesting, very small country, actually. It's, it's about um, 20, 26,000 um, square kilometers. It's in the center of Africa. It's just two or one or two degrees south of the equator. Um, it's a small country. It's about half, a little bit more than half of Switzerland. Um, <coughs> And it's one of the poorest countries in Africa. It's, it's getting better in the last 10, 15 years, but still it's a really, really poor country. It's, it's surrounded on the west by the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a very bad country at the moment. In the north, Uganda. Um, in the east, Tanzania. And in the south, Burundi. Rwanda has, is, has the center, the city center, um, Kigali. Kigali is, is one of the most vibrant cities in the world. That's what a lot of people say at the moment. It's a really interesting city with three, three million people, a very clean city. <coughs> but, on, but it's still outside of, outside of Kigali, it's, it's just nothing. But it's still a very beautiful country. It's called Land of Thousand Hills. It's, it's quite up. It's, the, altitude is big, the, most, the altitude is about 1,000 to 1,500 meters. It goes up in the northwest. There are the volcanoes. Um, you may know about the, the eru some eruptions some two months or three months ago, the Nirangongo volcano. It's a little bit It's more um, in the Congo. But he, he, it erupted two months ago. But it's a wonderful country. And it's, the climate is it's actually very nice. It's between 20, 25 degrees. And it, they don't have seasons. So there's no summer, there's no winter, there's every day the same. Sunrise at 6.45, sunset, sunset at, uh, at 6.45 in the afternoon. Needs 10 minutes, and then it's black, dark. Yeah. And it's all the year always the same because you are so close to the equator. But still, 20, 25 degrees is very nice. And the only season we have, we have a dry season and we have a rainy season. And even in the dry season, it's raining. And when it rains, it rains at 4 o'clock, 20 minutes, and then it's done. It's, it's really strange for us. But it's, it's, it's so nice. The only thing is, the problem is, 
there are so many people living in Rwanda, and we're, we're getting more and more people every year. So this is on a Saturday morning. On a Saturday, it's actually everybody has to be in the church, but still you see so many people. This is a small city in the north, Musanze, but there's everywhere, when you look up on the mountains, when you, where everywhere are people. You, you, will, you have no chance to see something without people. They are everywhere. I mean, they have 550 people living on a square kilometer. When you compare it to Germany, it's 240, 250 per square kilometer. So it's, and it's getting more and more. And that's the main problem of a country. Because there are so many people. There are no shops. When you go to the market, when you need something, when you want to buy something, and when you have to sell something, you go to the market either. Because you, are no, you don't have a car. When you are really rich, you may have a bike. But normally, you go by your feet. That's what most of the people do. So, so sometimes, when you have a bike you go, and you go to the market, we, we, we thought it this guy here with 60 kilometers down the hill. And you have to know about the, 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 the bicycles in Rwanda, they don't have brakes. Yeah? But the good thing is, you know, you have the hill, then you have the valley, and then you have the next hill. So, you know, it's going up again. But it's, the, the problem the guy has, he's alone, and this is probably 100 kilograms on his bike. And at the next hill, there are some guys waiting for him, and they, he gives them a little bit of money, and they help them push up the bike to the next hill, and then it's going again to the next. So that's transportation in Rwanda. It's really true. And sometimes, you know, they, there are so many people. So they, they, when they build cities or something, oh, going back, sorry. When they, when they, build, when they build a road, um, they, they don't need machinery or a lot of equipment because there are so many people. They do everything by hand. And you always find people. I mean, when you look for someone to help you, you find hundreds. It's not a problem. Everybody lo is looking for a job. Everybody really tries to do something. On the other hand, there are some things that are really modern. And the, they had a lot of, they, they built, the, they call it the Western Street. You know, down here, so you see the African Street, a really good one, actually. Probably one of the best. But they have now some Western Streets. And the problem is, there are some cars, and everybody is going so fast as you can, and they had a lot of problems. So what we now have, they have a, a strict traffic supervision, and they have the latest speed cameras you can think of. In about every second kilometer, there's another speed camera. And the interesting thing is, you know, they are really digitalized. So when you, when you, when you are too fast, and you get caught by the speed camera, it needs about 30 to 45 seconds, and then you have on your cell phone the problem, you know? how much you have to pay. That's really perfect. I mean, on one side, you have a very poor country, and when you have a really digitalized country, everybody has a cell phone, even the poorest ones, and when you, need, when you get a fine from a traffic camera, it needs 30 seconds. Different country. But Rwanda also, on the other side, has a wonderful nature, still just in very close places, very, very small places. One of the, the most famous things are, is the Vulcanus National Park in the Northwest. You probably know Diane Fossey, the name. Diane Fossey was a, a biologist, a primatologist. She, she lived there at, at the end of the 70s, in the 80s, till she was murdered there. And she was the first one, really, who said, you know, we have to, we have to help the, the primates, we have to help um, the nature to survive, because more and more people are living there. And she was one, and now they started the, the, <coughs> the national park system. And here you can see, you, on, on here, down here, you see, you know, everything is agriculture. In the north, they, they plant potatoes, sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes, whatever, and the, sex, the next year they, they plant um, permethrin. Permethrin is an insecticide, it still has to be planted. And it's, it's, it's very good because we have malaria as well in the country. And, but they, they plant this for the, <coughs> they grow it for the whole world actually. And when you go through the agriculture and when you, when you come to a wall and you go over the wall and then you are in the jungle. It's, it's from 100% to 100%. And then you are in the jungle and then you can have a look at one of the gorilla families. 
So gorillas live in families between, let's say, 10, 15 to 30 um, animals. And they, they have, in the national park, they have about 20 families. They are used to men, and you can visit them. And you have one, maybe one and a half, maybe two hours a day. So they have everyday visits by people, so they are really used to them. And when you, when you are just one meter, maybe sometimes they touch you. It's, it's really, it's a fantastic thing. The other side, it's very expensive. You have to pay about 1,500 euros for one hour. That's a lot of money. But on the other side, you have to think, so many people, you know, they need more land, they need more things to eat. So without the money, you would, the, the, the gorillas couldn't survive. Because they would, the, the people would, you know, they, they get some of the money, the people outside of the park, and so they can buy something to eat. Okay, okay most of the money goes to the government, like all these countries have some corruption. But still, and this is the only chance of wildlife when, they get, when, they, when you can make money with them. And it's, 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 yeah, it's all the things you have to think about. But it's, it's an amazing thing. There are other national parks, like the, the Akagera National Park in the south, southeast. It's, it's a wonderful thing, actually. But you, you are going for hours, or not for hours, but for a long time, you go with your car over the African streets, so you have to go about maybe with five to 10 kilometers an hour. And then you have bananas everywhere, people everywhere. And when you come to a fence, it's a high electric fence with barbed wire. And then you have a gate. And on the other side, it's Africa, you know, like we all know it from, from TV and all this stuff. And it's, it's, it's very different. And on the other side, you see all the animals you would expect in Africa, but it's just in the park. For me, it's a little bit of feeling of Jurassic Park, you know. You have one world outside and a very different world on the other side. But still, at the beginning, they had, they had no fence, and then the, the lion, you know, the lion is thinking it's, it's so much easier to get a cow than to get a zebra, you know, and then they are, or for the elephants, the bananas are really looking good. So, they, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and there are always people, so they, 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 need, they don't want to have elephants in your garden. I mean, that's the problem. But going back... To, to, to Rwanda, to the history, to the, to the problems they have. I mean, it was a kingdom for centuries. It was a, a small country inside of Africa. Here you see a museum. It was uh, the house of the king. And then at the, at the end of the 19th century, the Germans took over. And so they, they made Rwanda part of German East Africa. And during the First World War, the Belgian took over from Germany because Germany lost the war. And the Belgian... People, the Belgian did something, but was at the, at, in the later it was a real big problem because they divided the people. They said, when the, some of the people, when you are rich, you have a cow. To have cow or you have to have cattle is, is the sign in Rwanda for richdom. When you are a rich man, you have a cow, maybe more. And then they say, okay, you have a cow, you are a Tutsi. And you don't have a cow, you are a Hutu. And so at the beginning, it was a, sh a social thing. But then the, the idea of races came up, and they say, no, that's not, that's not that's a, you are different races. So there's a race of Hutus, and there's a race of Tutsis. And there are some Twa, Twa are um, pygmies and um, gatherers and hunters, but that's a different story, and there are not many. But between Hutu and Tutsi, there was, so they, they were divided. And after 20, 30 years, they really, they, they believed it themselves. They are different races. And after the Second World War, it was a, a UN territory, and the Hutu took over the, the, the power from the Tutsis, and they had the power till the, the beginning of 1994. And at that time, there was a liberation army from Tutsis outside in Uganda, but the Hutus had the power, and the president was a Hutu. And at the, in the summertime, the president, the, the aircraft of the president was shot and came down just over when he was at the airport of Kigali. And three days after that, the genocide happened. So it probably was planned for a long time. And in three weeks, the Hutu, um, 
yeah, they killed about, nobody knows it, probably about 900,000 Tutsis. So in three weeks, I mean, the Tutsis flew into churches and so, and they, they, they pulled them out and they killed them with the machetes, what they had, and they killed all the Tutsis. Some of them flew to, to Uganda, and they, at that time, they built a liberation army, and at the end of 1994, the liberation army took over the power again in, in, um, uh, in Rwanda, and now we have still, now we have a Tutsi, at the pre as the president. But the good thing with the new president, the new president is now since 2000, it's not a democracy, but still, they try now to say we are not different races, we are all Rwandans. So they try really to change things and to change um, the mind. They have museums everywhere, so they really trying to, 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 to change things. But the consequence of the genocide was there were so many kids without parents and all that. And um, that was the beginning of our, or not our project, but the project of my Austrian friends. Because they built it and at the beginning, at 2004, they, 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 built it, they built an orphanage in the north and they took over 50 kids. So they gave them something to eat, they gave them something to sleep, and they gave them education. And this is the beginning of a project, Future for Kids. And it's a lot of more to say, but they grew up. And the idea is, you know, they had, they, at, the, at the moment, everything has to be by donation. So all the money is coming from Europe or the United States or everywhere. So the idea was to have something that they can get their own, they can make their own money. And we, it's, it's an extremely easy thing because they were veterinarians, and a veterinarian, what, what can you do? They, they built veterinary hospitals. They started in the north with a veterinary hospital. Here you see the film, it's very nice. A large animal hospital, and then the second thing was they built a small animal hospital in the capital of Kigali. And the newest project, the latest project, is they, they bought a very bad resort, a lodge, and now they renovate it. So all these things are actually only the purpose to get the money for the other projects. So, speaking about small animal medicine in, an, in a developing, in a third world country is not that easy, but still we have, this is the, the vet clinic in Kigali, we have the only x-ray system in, in the whole Rwanda. And, I mean, and you have to think it's, yes, I'm, I'm late. So they have a really nice hospital. We were aware, we, we really trained the people. So the cool thing is we did an AO vet course with bamboo. Bamboo is really good, actually, as dry bone. You can use it very, very nicely. And it works. Then we had, we had really bones from a, from a pig, did another practical course, and then we did the TPLO. I mean, they are in a, even in the poorest country, they are very rich people and they have dogs. So they have people who can afford a TPLO. The bad thing was, we had no arthroscopy, but still it worked, and makes the things short. The future is we build a new hospital now, for, because we have a lot of clients, and it's getting more and more, and the, they have new projects, the sewing center, and all that stuff for, for other people. But the main thing in the long run is they have to, have, they have to help themselves. That's the only way. We, not, we cannot help them for the next hundred years. So they have, and that's, I think, the, the main important thing. But still, at the moment, we need donations. Thank you, and sorry for being late. Thank you so much. That was, that was fascinating, um, and some great pictures as well. And I think we, we might start using bamboo from now on, right, for our courses? Yeah. Uh, I think we might have some questions for you, and I think we could probably fit one in while uh, Luke is setting up. So, um, okay. oh, we, we have an online uh, question, which is how many speeding tickets did you get while you were in Rwanda? Oh, I, I didn't have my own car, so it was easy. I was only saying, you, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> so how many speeding tickets did your driver four. get? <laughs> Maybe four or five. Okay. <laughs> Uh, any, anybody in the room like to ask a question? I'm sure there'll be a lot more discussions about this uh, when the bar opens later. Are you good to go? Okay. Uh, 
So our, okay. our next speaker is our third representative today from uh, Clinica Vezzoni in Italy. Um, and I'm sure everyone's heard of or, or knows Luca. So uh, Luca's going to... Luca's going to grab the headset. Luca is going to talk about uh, limb alignment correction and TPLO. So, okay. okay. Great. Welcome, Luca. Okay, thank you. Um, it's really difficult to talk about uh, limb alignment and tibial alignment after such an amazing lecture, but uh, anyway, I'm really happy to be here in this live, live symposium that we were missing a lot live events. So the topic of, uh, <coughs> of this lecture is the correction of excessive valgus deformity of the proximal tibia during TPLO. We know that uh, in, um, in some cases, cranial cruciate ligament rupture is associated with valgus of the proximal tibia. Uh, and we know that valgus of the proximal tibia lead to an, uh, an uh, abnormal load into the joint that can uh, cause a progressive uh, degeneration of the joint. So that's why, ideally, we should treat both conditions simultaneously, so stabilize the cruciate uh, rupture and also correct the valgus uh, of, the, of the proximal tibia. Uh, when to correct it. We, uh, we know how to evaluate the valgus of the proximal tibia, so we know what is the reference value considering uh, a normal uh, proximal tibia. So the, the average mean angle is, um, for the mechanical media proximal tibial angle is 90, about 93 degrees. So values over 93 degrees are considered pathologically uh, valgus. When to correct the valgus of the proximal tibia? Not every case needs to be corrected. Uh, we should consider correcting proximal tibial valgus with TPLO in cases in, of non-compensated deformities. That means that if we have a, a varus of the distal femur associated to a valgus of the proximal tibia, that's a compensated deformity. So we should not correct the, the valgus with TPLO unless we also treat the distal femoral varus, because otherwise we are going to create a genuvarum. While when we have non-compensated deformity, which means a normal femur or a valgus of the distal femur together with the valgus of the proximal tibia, in those cases we should correct the valgus together with the, with the, with the TPLO. And this is a condition that we uh, mainly see in uh, large to giant breed dogs. How to correct the proximal valgus together with TPLO? We have two options. One, one which has been described by We and Kowaleski a few years ago, which uh, involves combining a proximal tibial osteotomy together, a transverse tibial osteotomy together with the TPLO. The technique proved to be really effective and accurate in achieving the correction. The drawback is that it's a quite complex osteotomy and an unstable osteotomy, so requiring adjunctive fixation implants and stronger implants to uh, decrease the risk of fixation failure. The other option uh, has been described by Slocum many, many years ago during his TPLO courses and involves uh, uh, performing a double osteotomy with a, with a TPLO saw blade, so creating a media closing wedge osteotomy with a radial blade. Um, Slocum described the technique at his, at his courses but never published the, the results of the technique. So that's what we did uh, um, last year in 2020. We published the results of uh, our cases with, uh, with this technique in uh, about 10 years. Uh, including 52 cases. Uh, the technique looks much more uh, simple than the combination of the TPLO and transverse uh, osteotomy, so we can go uh, quickly through the surgical technique. Concerning the preoperative planning, we just make our st standard evaluation of the tibia plateau angle and the mechanical medial proximal tibial angle to evaluate the alignment of the tibia both on the sagittal and on the frontal plane. Uh, but that, that way we know how much we have to correct both the slope of the tibia plateau and both the proximal tibial valgus. Then we made our standard planning for the TPLO, so uh, choosing the, the radius of the saw blade and centering the saw blade and measuring the, the reference point D1, D2 and D3. Then concerning the, uh, the correction of the proximal uh, valgus, we go back to the codocranial view and we, uh, we know the amount of correction considering the preoperative medial mechanical proximal tibial angle, and we reproduce the, the amount of correction required on the tibia at the level of the uh, tibia plateau osteotomy, and we measure the width of the wedge on the medial cortex, which is the amount of bone that we have to remove with the, with the second osteotomy. In surgery, uh, we always need to use a jig to perform this kind of TPLO, 
so we position the first uh, jig pin, so the proximal jig pin, perpendicular to the patellar tendon, which means automatically that the pin is going to be parallel to the joint surface. And in cases of proximal tibial valgus, the pin will be divergent com compared to the long axis of the tibia. The distal jig pin is, is uh, inserted through the jig hole, so the direction is given by the jig hole and it's going to be parallel to the proximal one. So this will end up having the, the central arm of the jig again divergent from the axis of the tibia, so having the distal arm of the jig farther apart from the medial cortex. And then we start the TPLO as a standard TPLO, as a normal TPLO. We start performing the, the first osteotomy, keeping the saw blade parallel to the joint line, so that means parallel to the distal jig pin. Before completing the osteotomy, we start the second osteotomy, distal to the first one, and the, the width of the wedge has been planted from the X-rays. The most difficult part of the surgery is the direction of the second osteotomy, because the, we have to keep the saw blade at an angle respect to the distal jig pin, which is equal to the amount of correction that, it, that we require. But considering that uh, we are aiming to about 92, 93 degrees, that means that the, uh, the saw blade should be almost perpendicular to the long axis of the tibia. So this is a good uh, uh, landmark that we have to keep the, the, the saw blade at the right angle. And ideally, the, the two osteotomies should meet at the level of the transcortex. If we keep the, the, the right angle between the, the two osteotomies, we will end up uh, removing a, a curvilinear wedge and leaving uh, a gap only on the medial cortex, so having good bone contact at the level of the transcortex. To close the gap on the medial cortex, we just have to unscrew the distal uh, jig screw and move the distal arm of the jig closer to the medial cortex of the tibia. And this automatically will realign the central arm to the long axis of the tibia and close the gap on the medial cortex. At this, at this moment, the TPLO becomes a normal TPLO, so we close the gap and we just have to complete the TPLO as a standard TPLO. So we, we have to do our rotation and, uh, and stabilize the osteotomy with a standard TPLO plate. In, the, in this case, we don't need any adjunct fixation implant because it's a simple osteotomy and uh, it's not more unstable than, uh, than a standard TPLO. At the end of the surgery, we can, uh, in surgery, visually assess the alignment, so check the alignment between the long axis of the tibia and the, and the arm of the jig, and they should be uh, more or less parallel. So this is an example. Uh, if we look at the preoperative X-rays, in this case we have 99 degrees of mechanical medial proximal tibial angle, so about six degrees of uh, excessive tibial valgus, and the tibial plateau angle is about 30 degrees. This is the post-op, so we have 93 degrees of uh, mechanical medial proximal tibial angle and four degrees of TPA, so in this case the, the, the correction has been uh, absolutely accurate, and you can see that the osteotomy is well compressed, so like a, like a normal TPLO in the, in the post-op. Uh, if we look at the, the results from our study, uh, what is interesting is that all osteotomies were completely healed at the eight weeks recheck, which is what we usually expect in normal TPLO. That because, uh, that's because of the uh, normal, let's say, normal stability of the osteotomy is not more unstable than a standard TPLO, so also we can expect the, the same speed of bone healing. Uh, concerning the, um, the accuracy of the, of the correction, uh, those are the results of our study, so we, we included 52 cases. We can look at the mean preoperative TPA, which uh, was uh, 27, and the mean post-op was 7 degrees, so the correction of the tibia plateau angle, again, was uh, the average correction was, was accurate. And uh, if we look at the, uh, the valgus, so the correction of the proximal tibia valgus, again, the, medium, the, um, the mean preoperative value was 101 degrees, and the mean post-op was about 93 degrees, which is the reference value for a normal proximal tibia in the, in the average, average dog. So overall, the, the, the technique was effective in restoring the, the normal alignment of the proximal tibia, so achieving what is the, the reference value. But uh, uh, if we look at, the, at those cases, 92 is the, is the average. So overall, the technique is, uh, is accurate. But there were some cases uh, in which is, we, we have, haven't been so accurate. So you can see the, the extreme values were 88 and, and 98 degrees. And that's mainly related to the, the fact that the technique is highly operator dependent because uh, we have to be really accurate in keeping the second osteotomy at the right, right angle respect to the first one. Because if the angle is... Uh, 
if the two osteotomy are too convergent, we're going to meet before the transcortex uh, and achieving a greater correction. While if the, the two osteotomies are uh, too close to parallel, we are going to remove too much bone even on the transcortex, ending up having a, um, a lower correction than, than expected. Like uh, here we can see an example. In this case, we have an overcorrection. So we were started from 99, and the post op value is uh, uh, 89. Um, Another problem that we can have with this technique is that even in cases in which the correction is quite accurate, like in this one, if you can see in this case the, the post-op is 96, so it's uh, uh, not perfect, but not even bad. So we were starting from 104, so a se really severe valgus of the proximal tibia, and the post-op is just a few degrees over the, the reference values. But if we look in detail, at the codocranial view of this dog, you can see that there is a gap at the, at the level of the lateral cortex. So the two osteotomies didn't, didn't meet exactly at the transcortex, but we removed too much bone at the level of the transcortex. So we don't have a good bone up position on the side opposite to the osteotomy, and this can increase the stress on the implants and predispose maybe also to fibular fracture and subsequent failure of the implants. And this is related to a wrong direction of the second osteotomy. So can we do better? Can we make this surgery easy and the correction more accurate? Uh, probably yes. Uh, we talked about this with, uh, with Steve, and he developed this, uh, this saw blade. Uh, for the one who are attending the live meeting, you can see the saw blade at, at, at the boot, and you can also try the saw blade on the, on the, on the wood. This is a, a wedge. Uh, this is a radial blade with a wedge section. So with a, with a simple osteotomy, we are removing a wedge of bone. I call this blade the Coliseum blade because the, the shape resembles the, the, the Coliseum. Uh, <coughs> the blade at the moment is available in uh, three sides from 18 to 24, even if we should need a bigger one, so 27 and 30. And uh, at the moment is available only for a five degree of correction. So the, the angle of the wedge is five degrees. Uh, we have used uh, this saw blade in few cases. We can see here uh, one example. So this is a, a German Shepherd with uh, 26 degrees of uh, TPA and 100 degrees of uh, proximal tibial valgus. And this was a non-compensated deformity. As you can see, we have also valgus of the distal femur. The good thing of this is that the surgical technique is much easier. It's just a standard TPLO. So here in surgery, again, we evaluate the alignment. We have valgus of the tibia, and we position the jig as before, so the proximal pin is parallel to the joint line, uh, as, uh, as we described in the, in the previous technique, but we just have to perform one single osteotomy parallel to the, uh, to the jig pin, so parallel to the, to the joint line and exactly on the frontal plane. Uh, the only thing we have to be careful is that uh, removing a wedge of bone, uh, we are creating much more friction. So the, the, the blade is, is going to hit more, so we need a copious lavage, and we're going to uh, and we have to perform our osteotomy really gently without too much pressure. But the technique is really, really easy. It takes us maybe one or two minutes more than a, than a standard TPLO. Uh, after completing the osteotomy, again, this will end up having a gap on the medial cortex, so we just have to close the gap and stabilize the osteotomy with a, with a standard TPLO plate. And this is the, the post-opics race of, of this dog. And the correction can be, can be accurate. So if we look at this case, uh, we were starting from 100 degrees. The, the angle of the blade is 5 degrees, and the MMPTA after surgery is 95 degrees. So in all the cases that we have done, the correction was, uh, was really accurate. This is another example, again, from 96 uh, to 91. So respecting the five degrees uh, of, the, of the angle of the blade. And what is really, uh, really nice is that uh, we are going to automatically uh, reach the transcortex and that's all. So we, are not, we don't have the risk of removing too few or too much bone at the level of the transcortex. So in all cases, we have a perfect position of the two fragments. And, and, uh, and both in the codocranial and mediolateral view, so it looks like a really well compressed uh, TPLO. Um, probably uh, uh, we need uh, other blades because we only have the five degree blades, but if you look at our study, the average correction required was uh, 7.9 degrees. So we were discussing with Steve that we should at least need an eight degree blade or probably even a 10 degree. Uh, the range of correction from our study was for, from 4 to 13 degrees. The higher the angle, the easier it is probably to perform a standard double cut, double cut TPLO. But with lower angle, having those blades can really help in performing the, uh, an easier surgery with a, with a good accuracy of correction. So uh, we should need more blades, so 8 degrees and 10 degrees. 
The only drawback is that we're going to need a lot of blades because we need 5, 8, and 10 degrees for each radius that we're going to use. The radius that we use most commonly in our studies were uh, 24, 27, and 30, so we should need at least uh, uh, 9 blades. So that, that's a little bit more expensive, but the, the surgery becomes really, really much easier. So in conclusion, uh, correction of the proximal tibial valgus together with TPLO can be done. Uh, it's, it's, it's effective for correcting both deformities, so to correct the alignment of the sagittal and on the frontal plane. Uh, the, the, the procedure seems a, a, a valuable alternative to the combination of the TPLO and, TPLO and transverse osteotomy, and this looks much simpler, in my opinion, and above all, doesn't require any adjunctive fixation implant. The osteotomy is much more stable. Using the, the wedge blade makes the surgery even more, more easier. So we don't have still a, a big case log with, the, with this, in, with this uh, saw blade, but all the cases we have done, uh, the correction was really accurate and the surgical technique simple with a really good position. So probably this will be uh, a better tool to perform this technique, but the only drawback is that we, we're going to need uh, a lot more saw blades. So with this, uh, uh, I'm done. So I would be happy to reply any question. If we have time. Thank you very much, Luca. Yeah, we do have time. Uh, we're going to switch to a remote speaker now, which takes them a few minutes to uh, to make the changes. So, if anybody has any questions for Luca in the room, um, we have one at the front. If you cut five degrees from the medial aspect, you also get five degrees from the cranial medial aspect. So um, it could ha happen that it um, turns for five degrees internally. Isn't it like that? Uh, it should not, because we are removing bone only uh, on the frontal plane, and and keeping the, the jig will also prevent to alter the alignment of the, of the frontal plane because the, the alignment of the frontal plane is constrained by the jig pins. So we, we anyway try to look carefully at the alignment of the foot with respect to the, uh, to the sagittal plane before and after the osteotomy. And in all our cases included in the study, we didn't see any effect on the uh, torsional alignment, uh, okay. even then while compressing must, the osteotomy. There must be a small gap. No, there, there is not any and, uh, need no small gap because if the, the osteotomy is on the frontal plane, the, the problem of creating torsional deformity is the osteotomy is, is oblique respect to the frontal plane. But just removing on the frontal plane, the, the risk was uh, of uh, lowering the cranial part of the plateau. That was uh, my doubt. So uh, having a higher correction than expected concerning the TPA, but then actually uh, we didn't have any cases also about that. Uh, the, the, the important thing is again to remove the wedge only on the medial side, not to remove on the, on the, on yeah, the but, lateral. But the blade, the blade just removes everywhere, all over the, all over the, 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 the blade surface, yeah. removes five, five degrees or yeah. let's say ten degrees. So mm -hmm. this is not in the, uh, the door, a proximal distal way, it's also in the cranial way where it removes five degrees so when you remove this five degrees yeah that, uh, there that, must that be was a small s even when when you get a, a five degree uh, virus per position you also mm -hmm. get a five degree internal rotation when you just when you just compress the proximal fragment to the distance segment and you get it without a, without a gap but if you're not on the front of plane if to correct deformity on two planes, you need to perform an oblique osteotomy. But if you are only on one plane, when you compress the osteotomy, okay. that is lowering the, the medial side and a little bit the, the cranial. My concern was that lowering the cranial could decrease the tibia plateau angle too. But the torsion has never been uh, affected. And that also constrained by, by, the, by the jig. I think we later on tried on the, on the, yeah, on the yeah. wood. OK? Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, do we have Otto ready now? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you, Luca, um, very much for that. Uh, there were some more questions from the online audience, um, which we may get to later if, if we have time. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is uh, a reappearance of uh, Otto Lanz, uh, Keon's 
Chief Medical Officer. And uh, Otto's title for this next talk is Revisiting the TTA. So uh, welcome back, Otto. Um, this morning, I was just going to discuss the refinement of the TTA procedure over time. Uh, one important thing to remember is that the principal goal for the tibial tuberosity advancement is to stabilize the stifle in the stance phase, and this will improve the quality of life of the patient and those that have craniocruciate ligament rupture. And this is done by advancing the tibial tuberosity because, again, the joint forces of the stifle are parallel to the patella ligament, and advancing the tibial tuberosity advances the patella ligament which will again act to neutralize the uh, forces acting on the stifle by making the patella ligament, uh, at least a common tangent, perpendicular to the patella ligament. Before I get uh, too involved in this presentation, just one comment. This is not the type of presentation that is supposed to make someone convert from doing a TPLO to a TTA. This is more to uh, help those that are doing TTA to remember that you know it does work. There has been changes over time to the TTA. And again, just to make sure that this information is being disseminated properly so that um, you have confidence in the procedure. Um, later on, if we have time, maybe we'll get into some of the uh, discussions of TTA versus TPLO, but this is just again, uh, to go over the changes. So the biggest changes over time that have been seen with the TTA is pre-planning for sure, especially with the new surgical software, patient positioning, uh, looking at the common tangent at the advancement, selection of proper implant sizes, which is always important, the surgical technique itself, mainly relating to the osteotomy in the implant positioning, and then to go into a little bit of detail of the use of spacers, not only for cases of patella luxation, but just in standard craniocruciate ligament uh, disease dogs, and also the soft tissue closures, uh, especially the medial cruel fascia. This is very important. Again, this is something that has been overlooked in the past. One of the things that I see, which is a very common fault in evaluating a lot of TTA planning, um, having people email me their cases and looking at them, is actually having very good uh, quality radiographs of the stifle and what's required. And we'll go over this in just a little bit. I do feel that sedation is required to really get good radiographs, depending on where you are, where you practice. It may be mandatory that you cannot have somebody in the room. And if so, again, sedation is um, going to be very important. Uh, this picture on the right that you see is from Andy Torrington. And Andy did an interesting study in what is the best way to position a dog on the radiographic table to ensure that you are going to get a proper radiograph of the stifle so that you can do the planning. The two groups was one with the contralateral limb abducted away from the patient and the affected limb again held in extension and the other group was with the limb just advanced cranially. And what they found is that taking the limb and just advancing it cranially and here you can see it tied with the leash does help guarantee that you are going to get a proper radiographic view of the stifle, which we'll go over as well. And then again, uh, either cranial caudal or caudal cranial view of the stifle is also required. Another important aspect is with the calibration, um, whatever fiduciary you use, whether it's you know the one centimeter, I mean, excuse me, the one inch uh, ball bearing that you place, it's important to place the ball bearing, as you can see in this picture, it's just to the right of that wedge foam, is to put it as close to the area of interest as you can get. So either right at the level of the patella ligament, if you put it too far away from the area of interest, this is gonna affect the calibration, which is gonna affect um, how much you advance and what implants you do use. Um, and then lastly, the other important thing uh, to remember with the calibration is that if you use it in an articulating arm, it's easier to position as opposed to just putting it on a roll of tape, which may affect the level of which the fiduciary is placed, which is also going to affect the amount um, of the calibration itself. 
So when we look at the radiographs, when you look at the medial lateral view to your left, what you are looking for is, again, that you can see the fibula. I'll start with that. And then the next cortex that you're going to see is actually the medial tibial cortex and then the lateral tibial cortex. And again, you really want this to be as straight as you can because this is going to affect your planning for sure. Um, the fiduciary, again, is close to the area of interest. Putting it right at the level of the um, patella ligament does help. But again, one drawback to that is that when you do your pre-planning and your virtual planning, it may be in the way. The limb should be held in extension and how much extension at the beginning, it was really reported to be at 135 degrees, but you may want it even more extended. And I like for the limb to be extended right to the point that the patella ligament is still straight and taut. If you do see that the patella ligament is somewhat collapsed or that it has a kink in it or crinkles in it that you can see, you've overextended the stifle. And you want to make sure that you can see uh, superimposition of the uh, femoral condyles and that you should be able to see the long digital extensor, the origin of the long digital extensor. And then also what's called the tuber of Gertie or the cranial eminence of the long digital extensor fossa, you should see that as well. And then looking at the caudal cranial view, the one thing that you really want to make sure is that the patella is well centered. If you are going to measure the proximal, medial, and lateral tibial angles, make sure that you include the talus. This is not included in this view. But again, you want to make sure that you get proper positioning um, with these patients. Manual templating used to really be advocated and acetates, and everyone remembers these that took the course. They would have a printed radiograph, a lateral, uh, medial lateral projection of the stifle. We would go with the um, acetates and measure how much to advance and implant and size. The problem with this, and inaccurate may be too uh, harsh of a word, but given today's technology, it's just not as repeatable and consistent as digital radiography. The other uh, thing that is no longer used is this rough reference range. I think at one VCOT it was discussed as the Goldilocks theory that small dogs get three millimeters, medium dogs six millimeters, large dogs nine millimeters, and again, the um, extra large dogs of the giant breed get to 12 millimeters. We have to remember that now with the accuracy of uh, digital planning that you know these reference ranges should not be used, that you should actually go in with the proper um, measurement so that you can get proper advancement and implant sizes as well. So what pre-planning software is available? Um, uh, the one that I use is Epop Pro by Rory. Um, I, I really do like this a lot. You can use DICOMs, you can use JPEGs, you can incorporate it right into the medical records. Biometrics is coming out with Lightbox. Um, that should be available soon. Uh, when that becomes available, um, we'll probably switch to that. And then there's Horus, which is, again, a free uh, program that you can use. Again, the problem with Horus is that um, it takes up a lot of memory in your computer. And again, you can't really directly put it into the medical record. But again, either one that you use is going to be better and more accurate and at least more consistent than doing um, acetate or manual planning. So the first thing we do is with the common tangent. Again, the common tangents are the two points, uh, the femoral condyle and the tibial condyle, that are going to be in contact. And again, this is very important so that we can do our planning because we do want to make sure that the common tangent is accurate. If you have good radiographs with the stifle properly positioned, it's going to make this a lot easier to do. The common tangent on the tibia or on the tibial condyle is always going to be bigger than the femoral condyle. And again, for the medial condyle, uh, I mean, for the tibial condyle, more often you're going to use the medial tibial condyle for planning. And again, for the um, uh, femoral condyle, you're going to be using the medial femoral condyle. If you do have a disparity in the femoral condyle, you can draw the outline of each condyle and pick the center. From that, we want to make sure that we advance, if you look at the radiograph on your right, that we advance the common tangent so that it is tangential to the patella extending distally. 
this gives you the best and the most accurate way to determine the common tangents. And again, at the end, if the um, if the common tangent is not perpendicular to the patella ligament at the end of surgery, you really haven't done the tibial tuberosity advancement properly. This is one common mistake. I still see this quite a bit is that people just measure from the tibial tuberosity to the common tangent and they just assume that, okay, well, 8.9 will use a nine millimeter cage. But again, with digital planning, one advantage is that you can do a virtual osteotomy, you can, advance, you can advance it, and you can see here that, again, the distance between the tibial tuberosity to the common tangent does not always equal the cage size. So in this example, you know, 8.9, somebody would use a 9, and then they would uh, be using a size or a cage that's one size too small in this case. The other thing that's important to remember when you do this is the position of the cage, which we're going to get into more detail about, and also about the plate size that we're going to use. And we're going to talk about the cage plate ratio because that's something else that's become important. So what do we do with digital preoperative planning? What I bring into the uh, OR every time I do a TTA is I make sure that I have the cage size, the plate size, which we're going to go more into detail about, the osteotomy, and again, the osteotomy, not only the distance from the tibial tuberosity uh, caudally, but also the length of the osteotomy. And we'll talk about the specifics with uh, the minimum lengths of the osteotomy, which is something else that's uh, been overlooked in the past. And then again, not only the plate size, but the length of the screws for the plate and how we can determine that now with uh, digital radiography. So again, these are just to show, uh, since there's no, I can't use my cursor as a, a pointer, I've just labeled everything. So A would be the distance from the tibial tuberosity to, again, the, the cranial aspect of the tuber of Gertie. And then B would be from the tibial tuberosity caudally to the osteotomy. And then C would be the overall length of the osteotomy. Again, we're going to get into more detail in just a second. And then again, when you look at D, this is a line drawn from roughly the fibular head distally to where that first plate hole is so that when I look, go back and look at the projection, I can determine about what size screw. And remember, we're going to add about um, four millimeters to this overall distance so that we can account for the head and the cutting flute of the threads themselves. So this is just one thing about going over the cage size. As you see, each cage size starting at 12 and going down to six, they do create an angle uh, by the advancement or an angle of the osteotomy. In order to achieve this, there is a minimum length of the osteotomy that we need to follow. Uh, we'll go what happens if you make this too short uh, or too long. There's repercussions to that as well. Um, this is available. This is something that you do need to pay attention to. Um, people would just draw a line and go ahead and just proceed with that. But we have to remember that dogs vary between the morphology and the anatomy of the proximal tibia, which is important. So again, not only knowing the width relative to the tibial tuberosity, but the length relative to the cranial eminence of the long digital extensor groove or the tuber girdy distally is also very important. So here's just a close up when we look at that same example and we've made our osteotomy. And again, this osteotomy is a little bit too short given, you know, for a 10.5, we look what the minimum should be. It should be a minimum of 46. Um, and this is shorter than 46. And at first you may think this is okay, but again, what's going to happen is you're not going to have good contact with the tibial tuberosity against the cage, and this could lead to fracturing of the tibial tuberosity. The other thing that it'll do is it will really crowd the proximal tibia, and again, that may lead to tibial tuberosity fractures as well. If the osteotomy is too long, and again, what's considered too long, once you're distal, to the proximal screw hole on the tibial, on the plate itself, 
or relative to the plate, that is going to create a stress riser and it may increase the chances for a fracture of the uh, tibia. This is probably the most the most difficult part of a TTA is assuring that you are perpendicular to the sagittal plane of the tibia. In these pictures, these four pictures, A, B, C, and D on the right of the slide, this is a cross section of the tibia. And again, the open area that you can see is the medullary canal where that um, turquoise or that light blue, kingfisher blue, Asterisk is, is the fibula to orient you, so that's the lateral side. The opposite would be the medial aspect of the tibia. The green line represents the saw blade, and the white line represents the sagittal plane. So A would represent the, the achieved goal or what you really want to do. Again, if we go to B, what B represents is you do hold a limb in the sagittal plane, but you're osteotomy is actually perpendicular to the cortex, to the medial cortex of the tibia. And again, this is going to angle the cut, which is going to not only affect the, you know, you're going into the long digital extensor groove and affecting the long digital extensor tendon, that we're also going to have problems with the fork and you may have fork uh, fractures or failure of the fork itself. And it could also lead to patelloluxations and under advancement, which is the most critical aspect of this. If you look at C, what C represents is if you accidentally internally rotate the tibia, what we're going to end up with is that same problem. We're going to go into the long digital extensor fossa and you can damage the long digital extensor tendon. And then D represents if the limb is externally rotated. And if you do this, what you're going to end up with is a very small area for the forks to actually engage, which may lead to failure of the forks prematurely. And again, it's important that these forks are in the cortical aspect of the tibial tuberosity and the heart or bone. Uh, one thing about, uh, you know, to remember, and this goes back to even pre-planning, the pre-planning does not take into account the curve for how much bone is removed by the saw blade itself. So if you're ever in, you know, you're deciding should you go smaller cage or um, a larger cage, you do have to take the curve of the blade into account. What I do like to use is a relatively short and a stout blade. I don't like there to be a lot of wobble in the blade. That way I can also make sure that I do my cut correctly. But overall, I would say this portion of the TTA is something that you do need to spend more time on. You need to make sure that everything is done uh, correctly. As far as the cage positioning in the past, what some people would do is they would keep pushing the cage distally if they did an intraoperative test for tibial thrust and they noticed that they still had some tibial thrust that's not a good idea. You really do want the cage positioned as proximally as you can right at the level of the tibial plateau. There is going to be a small portion of the tibial tuberosity that is proximal to the cage. That's okay. And again, the proximal screws, you want the caudal screw to be aiming in a caudal distal direction so that we're away from the fibular head, which is important to avoid that. And again, the cranial screw should be directed just in a cranial direction. As far as the plate positioning, um, this can be tricky, but we do want the plate to be as parallel to the tibial tuberosity as possible. With the proximal fork hole, you do want it right at the level of the tibial tuberosity or where the patella ligament inserts on the tibial tuberosity. And again, distally, you do want the screw holes to be centered over the um, the main area or the diaphysis of the tibia. One change, and Steve may have talked about this, is having new plates that provide um, inline bending or in-plane bending so that it's a little bit easier to guarantee that those screws are going to be well centered over the tibia. Sorry. 
Um, one recent um, event, and this is again talking to Andy and other people that have used the TTA, is to start using spacers, um, even in cases that do not have a patella luxation. Again, spacers are placed in the cranial screw hole of the cage in between the ear of the cage and the tibial tuberosity. These are just some recommended sizes for the three hole plate and the four hole plate to use a two millimeter spacer and for the five hole plate, a four millimeter spacer. And in those cases that have a patella luxation um, at the same time as a cranial cruciate ligament disease to use a six millimeter spacer. The reason for this is, this is again one of Slobodom's drawings, is during the TTA, not only do we advance the tibial tuberosity in the cranial direction, but we can also take advantage and move the tibial tuberosity lateral. And what that will do is it will help with the pull or the forces of the quadriceps to actually pull the tibia or to rotate the tibia laterally instead of medially. Again, in a cranial cruciate deficient stifle, internal rotation does become important and preventing internal rotation may decrease the incidence of um, medial meniscal injuries. The other big change is as far as the surgical approach, you know, can we do something with the surgical approach to better it? Um, where should this incision be on the approach as, a, as opposed to you know, making it in the center of the cruel fascia, as you can see, or what's called the PEZ, or referred to as the PEZ on the image on the left. And again, what is a better way of closure? Early on, uh, Pierre Montavon really did stress a medial aponeurotic sling. And this has been discussed, it's kind of been forgotten. And the reason it was forgotten was because of this approach of going through the center of the medial cruel fascia. And the purpose of doing the medial aponeurotic sling is to pull the tibia caudally and again decrease the translation of the tibia in the sagittal plane. So this led us to um, a, a big discussion. Uh, there was a lot of people in this discussion about how this incision was originally taught. How do we go ahead and teach it now? If you look at the solid green line on the image on the right, that represents the what people have transitioned to is an incision that's through the medial cruel fascia, leaving this tag proximally of the cruel fascia so that we can attach um, the medial cruel fascia when you finish surgery. The problem with this is there was a lot of tearing and you didn't get really a secure uh, suture of the medial cruel fascia. If you look at the dotted or the hash line, this is what was originally discussed. And in talking to the uh, Japanese surgeons, a lot of them were saying that they didn't have a lot of meniscal injury following surgery. And they felt that a big portion of this was because they were making the incision on the cranial border of the tibia and then caudally following the caudal belly of the sartorius. So going between the caudal belly of the sartorius and the cranial belly of the sartorius so that we could elevate that easily and then flex the stifle and advance it on the lateral aspect of the tibia when we do our final closure. So from this, this led us to a study just to investigate what are the three most common closures. Um, a represents the way it was originally taught and the way that the Japanese surgeons were doing it, which was to advance it and to do a simple continuous followed by five simple interrupted cruciate suture patterns. B was just the most common form that most people were using, which was a continuous suture pattern, and that was it. And then C represents a uh, locking loop pattern, which is a Mason Allen locking loop pattern, which was, again, used by a small amount of surgeons, but they felt that this was the strongest way. So what we ended up doing with this is that we did test these, and again, group A is the, the traditional way of doing a continuous plus five simple interrupted cruciate patterns. B represented the continuous pattern and C represented the modified Mason Allen. And what we found is that no matter what pattern you did, you really are only getting this back to 32% of the original strength, which goes for both TPLO and TTA. 
because the same approach is used by some surgeons on this. Interestingly, if you look at group B, that had 28.3% newtons as a finishing strength. If you look at the standard deviation, some of these were actually down you know, into the 10%, which is just a few steps. And when we tested these, the, the intact groups, they all failed by just failure at the myotendinous junction. And in the repaired groups, they all failed at the suture line. And again, none of the sutures actually broke. This was more tearing or pulling of the medial cruel fascia. So again, the other thing to remember is that suture selection is also going to be very important in these cases that you should use appropriately sized suture. For most dogs, you know, medium to large breeds of dogs, you should be using zero suture. Just a single pass has a strength of uh, 90 newtons as compared to 2 suture, which just has 30 newtons. So it is important not only to remember the pattern that you use, but also the suture diameter as well. And again, you could be as low as 10 to 11 percent. So using appropriately sized suture is also going to be important. And I would not recommend just doing a simple uh, continuous closure. And I've heard a lot of people have said yes, but when I go back in, the fascia, the medial cruel fascia is intact. But again, we have to remember just because it's imposed doesn't mean that it has much strength. And the other thing is the gap distance is also going to be very important in these cases. So again, in conclusion, uh, you know, outcomes and complications, proper planning, I can't stress enough. If you, and, and the radiograph on the right is actually, that is a, an image that I was sent. And then when you see an image like this, you know, you kind of question the surgeon, you know that there wasn't any planning intact and it leads to the question, you know, are you blaming the technique? Are you blaming the surgeon? What exactly is to blame here? But now, without doing any planning or digital planning whatsoever, you're just planning for failure. Remember, surgical technique is very important. Uh, roughly, um, and I forgot to mention this, but the cage to plate ratio should be greater than two to one. So if you're using a five-hole plate with a nine-millimeter cage, you really need to rethink your planning because it should be you know, minimum two to one. And sometimes you can use a 10 and a half cage with a four hole uh, plate um, that is acceptable. And it's something that you do need to remember. You don't always have to use the biggest plate because that can use the problems. Closure is also important, taking time. We have to remember that the medial cruel fascia is made of three tendons. These tendons are important uh, to close and to do that properly. And again, by doing correct surgical technique and planning, we can certainly, as you look at the image on the left of going back in and removing the caudal horn of the medial meniscus, that's going to be important. And lastly, quality of implants. I know that there's a lot of different types of TTA implants, but Keon has put a lot of time and research in their implants as far as I'm concerned. And I know that I'm biased to me are the most, um, have the best quality associated with them. And one last thing to remember is that all surgical procedures undergo refinement. I know this is not a conversionary type of uh, lecture where everyone that does a TPLO should now be convinced to do a TTA. That's not the expectation, but I did want to disseminate this information to as many people. But if we look at the third image from the left, this is when Barclay Slocum, uh, when I was a resident at the University of Florida, um, in 1996, he came and he taught the course, and this is directly from his course. If most people looked at this image that do TPLOs, they would say, wow, that's not a very good cut, that the image on the right of the TPLO with the key on plate is a much better cut. And again, this has been done by a lot of input uh, from surgeons and a lot of studies that have been done. And again, through the advancement of better planning, um, and better surgical technique. And the same thing goes with TTA. It certainly has gone over uh, its changes. It's a newer procedure. But for those of you that are doing TTAs, I don't really think that there is a great need to all of a sudden, you know, change to a TPLO. And that's the conclusion. And again, thank you for coming. And I'll be happy to answer any questions now or at the break, uh, depending on how much time we have.
Great, thank you, Otto. Um, we do have one question that's come in from the internet while we're just switching presentations over. And the question is, uh, I sometimes combine a six-hole plate with a five-fork in order to have the 3.5 millimeter screws. Is there a contraindication for this mix? Well, it's an interesting combination if you look at the cage to plate ratio. Um, uh, I think what would be, you know, and I would extend this out to anybody, if you could just email me the cases, your preoperative radiographs and your planning, uh, I'd be happy to look at them. But again, the five and the six combination, almost that one-to-one -one combination is something that um, I wouldn't expect to see. Thank you very much. Otto, just in relation yes. to the action, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, with the osteotomy and the distal point of the um, the uh, advancement, the the bone, as such, right. and the distal part of the osteotomy on the tibia, to have those still connected, uh, just but instead of where they they rise up a little bit you know, a couple of millimeters, five millimeters. Most of the time they are going to, the tibial tuberosity is going to shift um, proximally, usually about, you know, two to three millimeters, and that is okay. I mean, that's, that is part of the, the procedure. If it doesn't, um, like in the TTA2, which is, you know, yet another procedure, yet a different type of planning, you take that into account. But for the TTA, it will shift um, yeah. proximally, maybe two to three millimeters, depending on cage size, depending on length of osteotomy. But you want, again, you don't want it to be at the level of that proximal screw hole of the plate. But at the distal, um, in the distal area, is it's okay to have that point st still in alignment as opposed to rising a couple of millimeters, is it? Um, I like, would say- It's possible to bring it back down. Right. I would say in 90 plus percent of the time, my advancement makes the tibial tuberosity go proximal a few millimeters. Now, I've intentionally pulled it distally in some cases where I thought I had what's called a patella alta, like a patella alta slash patella luxation at the same time. Yeah, th that's... <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, that's that's my question. I was just wondering because I try to get it back down, and so that's it's okay. In other words, to bring it back. Yeah, but if, you have if, to if, take if that possible. into account. Yes, you have yeah. to take that into account in the planning, though. And if you do it on the planning, it sometimes you do have to, you know, again be cognizant of the plate size, and you also have mm -hmm. to be cognizant of the advancement because it may cause you to change uh, cage sizes as well. Yeah, that, yeah, great, lovely, thank you. So uh, one for Luca, I guess, with a closing wedge double osteotomy, would you still be able to provide compression with the TPLO plate like you would with a conventional TPLO? Uh, yes, usually we, we try to compress the osteotomy, so using a standard TPLO plate with a dynamic compression hole, we, we try to achieve the best compression uh, as possible. Thank you. And, and a follow-up follow up one to that, um, which was, do you also have to bend the plate for this procedure that involves the angulation change? No, no usually no. It depends on which plate you are using, but uh, if, uh, for example, with the key on, uh, usually not. You just have to uh, find the best position in order, to, in order to have a good contact between the plate and the bone. Or with other locking screws, we know that the contouring of the plate is not so important, but uh, it's very uncommon that we need to contour the plate in those cases. But uh, it, it again depends on which plate you are using. Uh, but in the, in the majority of cases, no. Thank you. Uh, one, for, one for Stefan now. Um, they saw that the, you recently did the first TPLO in Rwanda. Uh, could you expand a little bit on the circumstances of, the, uh, of you doing a TPLO in such a obviously poor country? Yeah, I mean, even in the poorest countries, they are very healthy people. That's one thing. And the other thing is, in, in especially for Rwanda, because Kigali is such a wonderful city, a lot of expats, so people who are working in Africa, live in Kigali. 
and they are, most of them are coming from Europe or the United States. And so they, they have a lot of animals and they have the money to, to afford a TPLO. And the second idea was, you know, it, it, we had a, a big German Shepherd and it, it was a little bit of fun to do a, to do a TPLO. That's what I have to say. But, but on, on the long run, it, it, it was also a little bit of advertising because we, 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 we posted it on, in the social media and we got so many responses. So it was more an, a funny advertising thing, actually. Very clever, very, very inventive advertising. Um, so what, I'll just pause and look around the room. Do we have any in-room questions? Because we have a couple more here. Yeah. R R Rwanda, is, Rwanda is very safe, so it's it's not there are no problems. You can go actually everywhere. It's it's not a problem. It's really safe. Its history didn't frighten you. Yeah, the, the history is now 20 or maybe 25 years ago, and in Africa things changing very fast. So so at the moment everything is really good. I mean, so we didn't we didn't had any problems, and and you you don't face problems actually. It's very different if you go to the neighbor country like the Dem Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. I mean, they shot you, shoot you. <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, good. We're glad you made it back. Um, I, I guess this question's for, for Luca. Why and when do you use bicortical screws in the distal part of the TPLO plate? Okay, th th that's a very good question, and uh, again, it depends on which plate we, we are using, because with uh, all the conventional TPLO plates, all generally with all TPLO plates, it is recommended to use all bicortical screws in the distal. With the key on TPLO plate, uh, uh, the recommendation from uh, Slobodan uh, was to use all monocortical screws in the distal to, to preserve as much as possible the endosteal blood supply. Uh, uh, we discussed a lot that with uh, with Lobodan. Uh, honestly, I don't think there is any drawback in using bicortical screws in TPLOs. Those are uh, metaphysical osteotomy, very quick healing. So uh, I think all of us doesn't have many problems with bone healing after TPLO. So I feel safer in having at least one bicortical screw uh, to counteract the torsional forces. Uh, so that's why I use always at least one bicortical screw, even when I use the key on plate. And if it's a heavy dog, I, I like to use uh, two bicortical screws. Thank you very much. Uh, one a question now for uh, Dominique. Have you ever tried to use any other uh, nylon material for this lateral suture technique? Uh, so again, I started with the tightrope. So tightrope was braided, and uh, I suppose it could be an alternative, but it's a, it's a braided suture, so my preference is to go with the monofilament. Uh, the nylon, I mean, it do, I don't think it matters which, um, uh, where you get it. In fact, uh, we just did a dog that weighed 40 kilogram. The double swage needle that I showed you does not come uh, with the 100 pound uh, uh, leader line. So we ordered the, the nylon from another company pre um pre-sterilized, and then we use the swage on uh, just regular needles, a uh, large cruciate needle and a large straight needle. So uh, I think there's flexibility, um, but I've used nylon all along. I mean, the picture that I showed with the lateral fibula suture, the traditional one with the black suture, that, that picture is very old, and I should actually credit Dr. Johnson for giving me that picture. So um, uh, it's, it's actually very cost effective. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question up here, which is for Luca. Um, great presentation, Luca. When you perform the wedge cut, how do you consider the bone, bone loosening by the two osteotomies? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Do you? Uh, no, me neither. Uh, I don't know if the, the question refers to the planning, so that the amount of, bull of the, 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 the thickness of the wedge is uh, measured on the, on the X-rays. So on the on the media cortex, if it, if it refers to bone loosening concerning limb shortening, usually it's not relevant because it's just a few millimeter on the media cortex. So I don't think it's a relevant bone loosening. But I don't know if I understand properly the question. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, any one last sweep round the room now to see whether anyone has, has another burning question? No. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. Well, that, there's a big one. <laughs> Lateral suture versus TPLO versus TTA. When, what, and why? So we're, we're not getting we're not getting to dinner. <laughs> so we sit here for the next three days, or? Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know who. Who would like to volunteer to give a 30-second discussion of that question? I would only tip a lower. So I'll give you um, one quick answer that's based on scientific data. My, uh, my impression of the literature is that there is starting to be some evidence that uh, TPLO may be superior to TTA. Um, after exercise, so maybe not at the walk, but in uh, hunting dog or active dog, uh, there are a couple of studies that I, I believe have uh, shown a slight uh, uh, um, improved gait uh, parameters in dogs that had TPLO. I think the lateral fibula suture is uh, an option for owners that cannot afford the TPLO or the uh, TTA and um, you know has been performed for years, especially in small dogs, seems to uh, provide very good results. So um, small dogs definitely, large dogs if they can't afford another options and some uh, evidence that TPLO may be a bit better than TTA. And Otto can uh, comment on that. <laughs> I mean that's depends on how much beer I can have before I answer that, but. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. I do. Uh, I think the easy answer is just to say whatever the surgeon is most comfortable with, I think is, is probably the best in their hands. But I do question a lot of the literature that's been put out about, um, TTA versus TPLO and TPLO versus TTA. Um, if you really look at those articles sometimes and critique them carefully. My questions are how many TTAs has a person done before in the past? And sometimes it's, well, we haven't done any, but you know, somebody showed us or someone taught us. So there's a lot of variables um, when you look at the literatures and I think it's very difficult. Um, I do. And I question how many of those studies, when you look at them carefully, uh, to be honest, I think here's an easy way to answer this question. What I would really like to see is all the preoperative radiographs, the postoperative radiographs, and the planning for every case that's submitted when you compare a TTA to a TPLO. I think that would greatly help people make a decision because even on some of the, the TPLO versus TTA papers, even some of the TPLOs seem a little bit odd, and I think some of the TTAs seem a little bit odd. So I think it would be great just authors include all preoperative radiographs, all preoperative planning, and then all postoperative radiographs. So if I could follow up, um, I was wondering if um, the speakers could comment as to whether they uh, take an individualized approach to a patient. So this is a trend, certainly precision medicine is a trend that uh, is uh, occurring everywhere in all fields, including in veterinary medicine, and um, uh, you know, doing both. Um, for example, I was, you know, I would do the TPA and measure the advancement and try to get a feel for what procedure would uh, be most helpful in terms of which parameter required most correction without getting into, for example, if a TPA has a is ex is in excess of you know, 30 degree, I would probably go with the TTA. Um, but if if the advancement is only four millimeter, but I have a, a TPA of 29, I'm going to go for a TPLO. Is anybody kind of trying to individualize or rationalize their approach per patient? I think everyone's scared to answer the question. <laughs> well, so there is a. I, I I I do agree with what Dominique is saying. I I I measure the TPA. I measure the advancement. I do it on both cases. I'm in a different environment, though. 
being in an academic environment teaching residents, I do like to expose them to both procedures. Um, I think the other difficulty I have is just being in a very rural environment, cost is always a problem. Um, when you look at our cost, you know, for me to do a TPLO and a TTA is the same. And even on a giant dog, the cost is going to be around 3000 So I, it, it's difficult for me to answer that, but I have seen, and I know we've all seen this if we're honest, not every TPLO does great. I don't know why. I can't answer that question. Um, but not every TPLO does great. Not every TTA does great. Maybe there's even a better technique that we have not yet discovered that's out there. Um, but um, it's difficult for me to answer it just given where I am. Great. If that makes Thanks. sense. Thank you. So I, we're coming to the end of our time here. So I guess the summary to that um, enormous question, which is probably worth a conference on its own, is something along, along the lines of there's no one size fits all, um, which is why Kion has solutions to all of them. So uh, I'll, I'll plant that kind of salesy thought in your, in your minds and ask you to thank our speakers again before we move on to the next session. Thank you.